Hey friend, Min Huang here of Life Giving Motherhood. I am a Charlotte Mason homeschool mom of four children, plus my friend's two children. And I have been a devotee of Charlotte Mason for over a decade now. I have read her volumes over and over again. They have been life-changing for myself and for my family. It is definitely a resource that I have been sharing and recommending to all of my mama friends especially. Therefore, a resource I would like to see freely made available to every mother, to every family. I have been leading a Charlotte Mason Moms Book Club locally. Many of us are ESL for the past several years. And so for my book club, which is quite diverse, I have been reading them aloud and recording them for my Charlotte Mason moms. I realized that it would be wonderful to have these recordings made freely available to every family out there and to have it all located easily, conveniently in one place. And the idea of a podcast came to mind last year. So here it is. I am beginning with volume four ourselves because half of my moms have started reading that and they've been requesting for me to record it for them. As well, it is a book that was written for students and my students are reading ourselves as of this year. So it's great to, for them to be able to hear it read aloud while following along in their books. After ourselves, I'll make up my way to volume five and then volume six before I loop back around to volumes one, two, and three. I hope this is helpful to you as well, dear friend. Chapter four, the Esquires of the Body, Chastity, how to rule the appetites. We have seen how each of the appetites, hunger, thirst, restlessness, rest, is a good body servant and how the work of each is to build up and refresh the body. We have seen too how a life may be ruined by each of these so innocent seeming appetites if it be allowed to get the mastery. To save ourselves from this fate, we must eat, drink, sleep at regular times and then not allow ourselves to think of taking our ease, of dainty things to eat, of th nice things to drink in the intervals. We should always have something worthwhile to think about, that we may not let our minds dwell upon unworthy matters. Each appetite has its time. There is another appetite which is subject to the same rules as those we have considered. It has its time like eating and sleeping, but its time is not until people are married. Just as eating, drinking, and sleeping are designed to help to make us strong, healthy, and beautiful bodies, so this other appetite is meant to secure that people shall have children, so that there will always be people in the world, young people growing up as old people pass away. This appetite is connected with a certain part of the body, and I should not speak about it now, only that one of the great duties we have in the world is to keep this part of the body pure. It is just like that tree of the knowledge of good and evil planted in the Garden of Eden. Uncleanness. You remember that Adam and Eve were not to take thereof, or they should surely die. And then you remember how the tempter came and told Eve that they should not die if they took of it, but should be like gods, knowing good and evil. Well, just in the same way, I fear, you may find tempters who will do their best to make you know about things you ought not to know about, to talk about and read about and do things you ought not to talk about or read about or do. I dare say, they will tell you these things are quite right, that you would not have such parts of your body and such feelings about them unless you are meant to think and do these things. Now it will help you to know that this is the sin of uncleanness, the most deadly and loathsome of all sins, the sin that all nice men and women hate and shrink from more than from any other. Purity. The opposite virtue is called purity, and Christ has said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That does not mean, I think, shall see God when they die, but shall see him with the eye of their soul about them and beside them, and shall know whenever temptation comes through this appetite, thou, God, seest me. That thought will come home to them, so that they will not be able to make themselves unclean by even a thought or a word. They will turn away their eyes from beholding evil. They will not allow themselves to read or hear or say a word that should cause impure thoughts. Glorify God in your bodies. Thus, they will glorify God in their bodies. Every boy or girl who realizes this is a hero in the sight of God, is fighting a good fight, and is making the world better. 
When the pure are married, their children will be blessed, for they will be good, healthy, and happy because they have pure parents. Remember that God puts before each of us in this matter the choice between good and evil, obedience and disobedience, which He put before Adam and Eve. They sinned, and death entered into the world. And so surely as you allow yourself in this sin of uncleanness even to think a thought which you could not go straight and tell your mother, death begins in you, death of body and soul. Fight the good fight, and do not let yourself, like our first parents, be the victim of unholy curiosity. The appetites are servants, not our masters. Let each of the appetites so necessary to our bodies be our servant and not our master, and remember, above all things, that sin and slavery to any appetite begin in our thoughts. It is our thoughts that we must rule, and the way to rule them is very simple. We just have to think of something else when an evil thought comes, something really interesting and nice with a prayer in our hearts to God to help us to do so. Chapter 5 The Pages of the Body The Five Senses The esquires of the body have in turn their attendants, their pages, let us call them, very useful persons in their way, but like the esquires they require looking after, in the first place to see that they do their work, in the next to secure that they do not become tyrants. For even they, servants of servants as they are, aim, if they are indulged, at the sole rule and subjection of Mansoul. People sometimes call these pages feelings, but we will call them sensations, because it is through the five senses that they do their work. Taste, agreeable and useful. The sensation of taste, one of these, is not only usually agreeable, but is most useful. When food tastes unpleasant, that is often a sign that it is not wholesome. Taste is an excellent servant, and people who know how to keep him in order find simple foods such as milk and bread and butter delicious. But pampered becomes our master. But people who pamper taste make themselves his servants. They say they do not like porridge. They do not like mutton, potatoes, eggs. They want things with strong flavors to please their taste. The older they grow, the more difficult it will be to gratify them so that at last it will take a French cook to think of things quite nice enough for their dinners. The best rule is not to allow oneself in daintiness about food, but to eat what is set before one. Indeed, a wise person is rather glad when something is served which he does not exactly like, or when he has to take disagreeable medicine, because this gives him an opportunity to keep taste in his proper place, that of a servant and not of a master. It is a good plan not to talk about our likes or dislikes, not even to know which kind of jam we like best. Smell is lazy. Smell is another of these pages, really a very good fellow, and I do not know that he tries much for mastery in Mansoul unless as the ally of taste. When he goes about sniffing savory dishes and making taste wish for them, he is very objectionable. Excepting for that he is harmless enough, but he has a fault which is bad in a servant. He is lazy. As his work is very important, this lazy habit must be dealt with. Should give Mansoul much pleasure. He might be the means of giving Mansell a great deal of pleasure because there are many faint, delightful odors in the world, like the odor of a box hedge, of lime trees and flower, of bog myrtle, which he might carry, and thus add to the pleasure of life. But that is not his only use. Should serve on the board of health. He should be quick to detect when there is the least impurity in the air, when a room is close, when a drain is out of order, when there is any unpleasant, unwholesome odor about, however slight, because all odors are really atoms floating in the air, which by breathing we take into our bodies. As we breathe all day long and all night long, and only take food three or four times a day, it is perhaps more injurious to health to breathe evil odors than to eat food which is not quite fit, though both are bad. But there are people in whom smell has become so inactive that they will lean over an open drain without perceiving any bad smell. By and by we hear they are laid up with a fever and nobody thinks of reproaching that lazy servant, Smell, who has been the cause of the whole mischief. Practice in Catching Odors It is a good rule to practice oneself in catching every sweet and delightful fragrance and in learning to tell, with one's eyes shut, the leaves of various trees, various flowers, foodstuffs, materials for clothing, all by their odors. In this way, smell will be kept in good working order and should be able to detect when he goes into a room whether the air is fresh or fusty. Touch, 
most pervasive. There are five of these pages classed together under the name of the five senses, but the three we have now to speak of are not so much pages to esquires of the body as body servants themselves. Touch is a most pervasive fellow. He is all over the body at once, and there are only one or two places like the nails and the teeth where he is not. He collects a great deal of useful information. It is he who discovers whether things be hard or soft, hot or cold, rough or smooth, whether they pierce or scratch or prick or burn. Most useful. You see at once how useful his work is, for without touch one might accidentally put one's finger in the fire and not know it was burning. Knives might cut, pins prick, frost bite, and fire burn, and we should be none the wiser, though our bodies might be receiving deadly injury. Some people have an exceedingly delicate sense of touch, especially in the fingertips, and this enables them to work at making such delicate things as watch springs and very fine lace. The touch of the blind. Blind people learn to find out through their fingertips what their eyes no longer tell them. They learn even the faces of their friends by touch and can tell whether they are well or ill, glad or sorry. You hear it sometimes said that a person has a nice touch in playing the piano and would really seem as if his fingertips felt not only the keys of the instrument, but the music they are producing. A kind touch. Some people, again, mothers especially, have so kind a touch that their hands seem to smooth away our troubles, but this sort of touch is only learned by loving. You remember Shakespeare thought that poor little Prince Arthur had it. Certainly, many loving children have comforting hands. Practice in Touch those persons whose senses are the most keen and delicate are the most alive and get most out interest out of life. So it is worthwhile to practice our senses, to shut our eyes, for example, and learn the feel of different sorts of material, different sorts of wood, metal, leaves of trees, different sorts of hair and fur, in fact, whatever one comes across. Touch tries for mastery over Mansoul. It will surprise you to hear that Touch, simple and useful servant as he is, like the rest, watches for mastery over Mansoul. Have you ever found it hard to attend to lessons or other work because you have had a prick or a sting or a cut, which, as you say, hurts? When people let themselves think about these little things which can't be helped, they have no thoughts left for what is worthwhile. Thus, one of the least of the powers in their lives becomes mastery of all the rest. You remember the story of the Spartan boy and the fox? It is not necessary that we should be Spartans, because if anything painful can be helped, it is right and necessary that we should speak about it or do something to take away the cause of the pain. Good to have little things to put up with. But, on the other hand, I think we should be rather glad to have little things to put up with now and then, a scratch, a mustard poultice, or a vest that pricks, just that we may get into the way of not letting ourselves think about such matters. There is an instance of a man who was obliged to have his leg cut off before Sir James Simpson had made the blessed discovery of the use of chloroform. This man was determined that he would not think about the pain, and he succeeded in so keeping his mind occupied with other things, that he was not aware of the operation. This would be too much for most of us, but we might all try to bear the prick of a pin or even the sting of a wasp without making a fuss. Sight brings half our joy. The two senses that we have still to speak of are ministers of delight to man's soul, and I do not know that they have any serious faults as servants excepting those of laziness and inattention. Sight brings us half our joy. The faces of our friends, gay sunshine, flowers and green grass, and the flickering of the leaves, pretty clothes and little treasures and pictures, mountains and rivers and the great sea. Where would our joy in all these be if we could not see them? Kind friends might read to us, certainly, but it would not be the same thing always as to have our own book and read it in the apple tree or in the corner of the window seat. Let us pity the blind, but there are other people to be pitied almost as much as they. Eyes and no eyes. Do you know how eyes and no eyes went out for a walk? No eyes found it dull and said there was nothing to see, but I saw a hundred interesting things and brought home his handkerchief full of treasures. The people I know are all either eyes or no eyes. Do you wish to know which class you fall into? Let me ask you two or three questions. If you can answer them, we shall call you eyes. If you cannot, why, learn to answer these and a thousand questions like them. Describe from memory one picture in your mother's drawing room without leaving out a detail. Name a tree, not shrub, which has green leaf buds. Do you know any birds with white feathers in their tails? If you do not know things such as these, set to work. The world is a great treasure house full of things to be seen, and each new thing one sees is a new delight. Hearing a source of joy. 
There is a great deal of joy, again, to be had out of listening, joy which many people miss because hearing is, in their case, an idle servant who does not attend to his business. Have you ever been in the fields on a spring day and heard nothing at all but your own voice and the voices of your companions, and then, perhaps, suddenly you have become silent and you find a concert going on of which you had not heard a note? At first you hear the voices of the birds, then by degrees you perceive high voices, low voices, and middle voices, small notes and great notes, and you begin to wish you knew who sang each of the songs you can distinguish. The more we listen, the more we hear. Then, as you listen more, you hear more. The chirp of the grasshoppers becomes so noisy that you wonder you can hear yourself speak for it. Then the bees have it all to themselves in your hearing. Then you hear the hum or the trumpet of smaller insects and perhaps the tinkle and gurgle of a stream. The quiet place is full of many sounds and you ask yourself how you could have been there without hearing them. That just shows you how hearing may sleep at his post. Keep him awake and alive. Make him try to hear and know some new sound every day without any help from sight. It is rather a good plan to listen with shut eyes. Some nice sounds. Have you ever heard the beech leaves fall one by one in the autumn? That is a very nice sound. Have you heard the tap tap of the woodpecker? Or have you heard a thrush breaking snail shells on a stone? Of course, you can tell the difference between one horse and a pear by sound. Can you tell one kind of carriage from another or a grocer's cart from a carriage? Do you know the footfall of everybody in the house? Do you know the sound of every bell in the house? Do you listen to people's voices and can you tell by the intonation whether the people are sad or glad, pleased or displeased? Music, the great joy we owe to hearing. Hearing should tell us a great many interesting things, but the great and perfect joy which we owe to him is music. Many great men have put their beautiful thoughts not into books or pictures or buildings, but into musical score to be sung with the voice or played on instruments, and so full are these musical compositions of the minds of their makers that people who care for music can always tell who has composed the music they hear, even if they have never heard the particular movement before. Thus, in a manner, the composer speaks to them, and they are perfectly happy in listening to what he has to say. Quite little children can sometimes get a good deal of this power. Indeed, I knew a boy of three years old who knew when his mother was playing Wagner, for example. She played to him a great deal and he listened. Some people have more power in this way than others, but we might all have far more than we possess if we listened. How to get the hearing ear. Use every chance you get of hearing music. I do not mean only tunes, though these are very nice and ask whose music has been played, and, by degrees, you will find out that one composer has one sort of thing to say to you, and another speaks other things. These messages of the musicians cannot be put into words, so there is no way of hearing them if we do not train our ear to listen. A great help towards learning to hear music is to know the notes, to be able to tell with one's eyes shut any note or chord that is struck on the piano or sung with the voice. This is as entertaining as a puzzle, and if we find that we are rather dull of hearing at first, we need not be discouraged. The hearing ear comes, like good batting, with much practice, and the time will come when in a whole chorus of birds you will be able to distinguish between the different voices and say which is the thrush, which is the blackbird, which the white throat, which the black cap, which the wren, which the chaffinch, Think how happy the person must be for whom every bird's note is a voice of a friend whom he knows.